in. I'll give her a second. Hi, Barb. Hi there. I'm trying to center myself here. Wrong way. There we go. <laughs> and I was explaining that us old timers who knew these before anybody else tend not to be the technologists in the room. We just play them on TV. We do. We do. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm just finishing one story and then we'll get on to you. So um, this is a number of years ago, maybe 15 years ago, 18 years ago. And I got a phone call from the head of a school where the children were seriously disabled. They had quadriplegics, they were breathing and, and typing with, with tubes and machines. And I got a phone call one afternoon and they said, Perry, we need you right away. Uh, there's a serious cyberbullying incident. We really need your help. So I didn't ask anything else. I got in my car and I drove much faster than I should have um, to Westchester County in New York. It was, so it was supposed to be about an hour drive. I think I made there, there in 20 minutes. Um, and I walked in and they had all these kids uh, on, on special reclining beds and wheelchairs that people were operating and, you know, not just kids with a cane. These are seriously physically challenged kids. And they were all in this room. So they handed me a mic and I said, I am so, so sorry. And they all looked at me and I said, I am so sorry. The technology that was designed to give you the freedom to do things you can't do in real life is being used to hurt you. And it is unforgivable, as far as I'm concerned, that kids can be harassed online, which should be your one safe place. <laughs> so the head of this hospital school came up and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, Perry, uh, I need to talk to you. So I said, what? And so she said, they weren't cyber bullied. They cyber bullied the head of the football team in town. So all these kids who can't walk, talk, and half of them couldn't see uh, were uh, standing up for somebody in their group who had gone out to the mall with his his attendants and he was in a special wheelchair. And this kid who was the head of the football team with his friends were making fun of him. So this kid came back to the hospitals where they lived and was part of the hospitals. We'll talk to all of his friends. And they all got together and they pretended to be big, bigger thugs than the head of a football team. And they had this kid terrorized. He had no idea that these kids couldn't do anything and they were in special wheelchairs. So I was like, yes, but I know I wasn't supposed to do that. <laughs> but sometimes, sometimes. And I was thinking about how children with special needs can be empowered to be the bully. And uh, so I know that you were going to yell at me if I ever said that out loud. So I had to say it before you got in. Uh, so they can be empowered in lots of ways. Yes. And they can take on people who are mean, even though they shouldn't be doing that. But I, I just, I was both overjoyed and heartbroken um, that these guys had started doing the stuff that I try to get everyone not to do largely because of them. But at the same time, they took it into their own hands and they felt empowered. So, Barb, I yes. want you, because you have the best background, would you introduce yourself to everybody from sort of where you started out? Well, uh, I'm Barb Coloroso. I'm an author and a lecturer, but also an educator in special ed. Um, I have been doing this work for 49 years. I'm going on to my 50th year. Wow. Uh, I have been all over the world and was just recently at the World Anti-Bullying Conference, 90 countries, and we all have the same issues. It's all over the world. It's a little different in each culture, but basically kids can be mean and cruel to anyone they see as less than themselves. Uh, and that process of dehumanization that happens in bullying. But I, I've got to tell you, Perry, one of the biggest issues for adults is that we fail to discern the difference between normal, natural, and necessary conflict, which can occur online and offline. And the fascinating thing about young people today is we can't say real world and online world. Online and offline have merged to become their real world. Yeah. The difference between conflict and bullying, which is a mean and cruel behavior. It's a conscious, willful, deliberate, hostile activity intended to harm where you get pleasure from somebody else's pain, whether it's online, offline, or sadly today combined to really humiliate, denigrate, uh, terrorize, taunt, 
uh, uh, another person, whether it's in the gaming activities or if it's um, uh, on the cell phone, uh, stealing somebody's password, uh, getting into their games and re removing them from a game, blocking them, or actually hacking their account. Um, things you and I never had to deal with, we have to deal with, and I as a grandmother um, am counting on my young grandchildren, 11, 10, and eight, uh, to help me out and share with me some of the things that are going on in their lives. We have to teach our young people to be digitally savvy digitally civil and digitally safe. But that means, first of all, you and I have to get digitally savvy. We have to know what our kids are talking about. Kids don't target one another on Facebook. Why? Grandma's on it. They target through apps today. And, and grandma's the only one on Facebook. Yeah. Um, but, you know, your grandchildren are now perfect ages for my new cyber safety agents program. And I've got a six and an eight year old grandson who started this. So we're hoping Lego will let us use Lego characters and having the kids solve cyber mysteries and crimes and help each other stay safe. So that's always a good part. Oh, the part is. I want you to talk about, though, is what you did before you became an expert oh. in bullying. That's, <laughs> it's just yeah. fabulous. OK. I'm a former nun, obviously yeah, former that. with a husband and three kids. No, I didn't marry a priest. Yes, I met him after I left the convent. So for all the Catholics in the audience, they don't have to worry about that. Uh, but I got to tell you, I'm glad I went. I'm glad I left. But it's both because getting uh, a major in theology and a minor in philosophy has held me in good stead in education and in my own life uh, and parenting. Um, and in the convent, we were advocates uh, and uh, we were activists uh, marching in civil rights and uh, with the, the farm workers. And in fact, after I left the convent and went to a new university in my home state, I met my husband at a um, uh, Cesar Chavez uh, uh, boycott march. So uh, we're in the same field, he's in human services, and. And so was I. Um, and then we had three wonderful kids um, who gave us grief sometimes. <laughs> and there are always moments in parenting. Uh, but through them and also working with seriously troubled adolescents, some, by the way, who got into our program because they couldn't take it anymore. Um, they had been relentlessly tormented verbally and socially, never physically harmed but couldn't take it anymore and struck back in the only way they knew how much as the students you were talking about, they got physical and they got in serious trouble for that. There were also some kids in my program who had gotten there because they were mean and cruel to anyone and everyone they saw as less than them. We have to remember that bullying online and offline is about contempt for another human being. And once I have contempt for you, I can do anything to you and not feel any shame or compassion. Um, the young boys who took uh, uh, Matthew Shepard and tied him up to a fence post, left him to die. When they were arrested said, yeah, but he was gay. James Bird, drug in the back of a pickup. Um, and uh, when he was dead, they said, well, he was black. Renee Virk, uh, tortured by her classmates as others looked on. And one of the girls in the courtroom said, yeah, but she was brown, ugly, and fat, I didn't like her. Other, utter contempt for the other human being. But I have to remind people that the title of my book is The Bully, the Bullied, and the Not-So-Innocent Bystander. I talked about that and, before you came on. Yeah, and that's a big issue now. It is. Um, and William Burroughs said it so beautifully, there are no innocent bystanders. What were they doing there in the first place? And uh, the roles that they can play, they can be the bully's henchmen online. You can have a bully who says to all the other girls, did you hear that rumor about her? Let's post it. She never does, but her henchmen do, and they get in trouble. Then you have the active supporters who witness offline bullying, video it, and post it on Instagram. Then you have the passive supporter who says, wow, I saw that Instagram post, and looks at it and laughs at the other child's pain. You see, bullying is about getting pleasure from somebody else's pain. And what we as adults have to recognize is that every one of these not-so-innocent bystanders are part of the problem. Um, 
You have the disengaged onlooker who turns a blind eye and says, oh, boys will be boys, girls just want to be mean as part of growing up. He's not in my class. I don't have to get involved or I'm not getting involved online with that. Uh, they're still part of the problem. Then you have those potential witnesses. Those are the kids you and I raised to act with integrity and civility and compassion, but they're afraid of the bully. They're afraid if they step in, they'll be next. They're afraid if they step in, they'll make it worse for the target. Or, or if they report simply, it, they're going to yeah. be held liable if it turns out they're wrong. wrong. Or, or the, the Instagrams of the world are going to tell the people they were the ones who reported them. All we have to do is look at the real life world we adults are facing today. Uh, the premise of my genocide book, which people were shocked. Oh, I thought you wrote on parenting and, and uh, education. Um, I work in Rwanda with orphans from the 94 genocide. And uh, the premise of my work is that it's a short walk yeah. from hateful rhetoric, whether it's online or offline, to hate crimes, which can be both online and offline, to crimes against humanity. And we're on that walk today. And that cultural climate influences our young people in the way they talk to one another yeah. and the way they see one another, uh, both online and offline. So we have to be very smart about um, the tools that kids are using, understand that uh, they can be used for ill or for good. I mean, we've seen kids with special needs um, use them to share in their own communities uh, and feel like they can belong and they truly can. So there are three kinds of families, the brick wall, the jellyfish, and the backbone. The brick wall parent says absolutely no internet, no cell phones, um, until they're older. Well, they never develop inner discipline about how to keep themselves savvy, civil, and safe. If we lock them down and control everything until they leave home, and then they have no clue how to behave, then you have the jellyfish who says, well, it didn't bother me. Of course, it didn't exist when you were growing up. And you know, I can't be bothered. And besides, it's a neighborhood. Well, there's some alleys and, and dark corners of the online world, just like there are in any uh, offline community. Uh, and then there's the backbone parent. The backbone parent has flexibility and takes age appropriate, ability appropriate um, opportunities to give the kids, uh, they're gonna use the media anyway. And if they don't have it at home, they're gonna borrow from a friend. So we have to let them know. Um, and, but you do responsibilities and decision-making just like offline uh, that are age appropriate, ability appropriate, and then uh, decrease limits and boundaries. You, There are certain boundaries we as adults have to have. Um, we have to trust but verify uh, with our young people so that by the time they leave home, they are making all of their own decisions and responsible for all of their behavior in the digital world. And a backbone parent is open to the good, the bad, and the ugly. And kids know that they can come to them and say, I was targeted or, ooh, I participated online. I don't feel so good about it. There is a fourth character, and that's the kid I'd like for all of us to raise online and offline. Um, and that's the brave hearted kid, kid willing to stand up and speak out and step in to say to somebody online, uh, that was mean, that was cruel. I'm out of here. I don't want to be a party to this. Now, opening themselves up. It takes courage. It's like offline. When the high status social bully in grade eight says to all the other girls, I don't like the new girl. You want to be in my group? Don't eat lunch with her. Yeah. Don't then invite we, her to a party. Yeah. You know. uh, put the backpack down so she can't sit. And that goes right into the on offline world and as well as the online world where they now video the kids ostracizing her at the lunchroom and getting pleasure from that. But saying, I didn't do it. I didn't ostracize her. Yeah, you did. You were party to it. But it's that young girl who has the courage to go sit next to the new girl. And, you know, it's so hard. And what I what I always say, and I, you know, you do both. First, you did offline before any online existed, and then you do so much now in cyberbullying. I just do cyberbullying. I mean, I do it at all ages and cyber stalking. Yeah, harassment. you do it, and you do it well, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, everything I've learned that I do right, yeah. I learned from you. But, but I always say that if you're going to be brave, the time to be brave is not publicly by saying, I'm out of here. I'm, you know, I'm not You're part right. of this. You either close your connection and don't say anything because it's so easy 
for you to be cyber bullied much more easily than real life bullying where it takes a lot more action and activity and people can watch you. So I always warn them that it's stop, block and tell, stop, don't answer back, block the person and tell a trusted adult. Can we talk about trusted adults? Yes, but I do stop, block, copy, tell so that I we have a copy of it so it, it hasn't disappeared. Um, yeah, and it, then we talk. We talk about adults. that because a copy doesn't do you any good unless you've got the code behind it. Yes, so you have to save it, not just copy it. Copy's good because then parents understand how awful and hateful and hurtful it is. But police can't investigate just on a copy. Yeah. So you we got that right. Clarify all of our messages as we've got. This yes, we carry. do. We do uh, because <laughs> it's a matter of that's the technology that you're so good at, and I always refer people to your your sites because you've got. What to do if somebody wants your password and they're your best friend today, but not tomorrow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and that kind of thing. Down, and we're doing it all new. And I hope I'm going to get a lot of your stuff to do it. I Please also do. registered for you a short walk. Nice. Oh, Shortwalk.com and okay. .org. I registered for you because Thank I you. really want you to do a lot on that, on, on the hate and radicalization and the contempt that's only growing right now among everybody. It has nothing to do with political parties. It's just everybody's out of control. Well, when you ha having studied genocide and been in Rwanda with orphans from that genocide, it started with calling them cockroaches. And that's why we cannot tolerate online or again offline people dehumanizing other human beings. Now you're talking, and I, I appreciate that, that you don't just step in right away, that there are other things you can do. You can shut it down yourself down. And suddenly when people are Report disappearing it. and re most importantly, always online and offline, I say, make sure you can tell a caring adult. That means we as parents have to be not so judgmental. And the biggest fear young people have about telling their parent that they've been targeted is you'll take their phone away. You'll take their computer away. You'll take their PlayStation away. Uh, and we have to assure them that, that that's not true, but we will help you be safe because that's what matters to us. So when you do that, then they're more likely to tell you, but we have to provide a very safe environment for them. And we have to teach them again, to be digitally savvy, but digitally civil. Uh, which we are doing a lousy job as adults right now, <laughs> yeah. makes me crazy. Um, when we hear the retribution, when we hear the name calling and the diminishing of another human being, bullies inflate their ego by deflating another human being. Uh, and they get pleasure from their pain. And we've got to say, I'm not going to be a party to this. I'm not going to get involved in this, but I will support the person who has been targeted. And we adults have to wreck. We're going to teach kids to be civil. We got to be civil. Yeah. I, I use three, um, an old Sufi saying, people of wisdom in the Muslim tradition. They had a passage that our words must pass through three gates before they're spoken. And I used to use it on my kid's computer, a yellow sticky note, because the computer was still in the family room then. Uh, but now I talk to my grandchildren about it. The first is, is it true? Not kind of true, maybe true, half true rumor, but is it true? If it's not true, don't you even think of sending it? Is it if it is true, then you got to go to the next step. Is it necessary? Does it really need to be out there for perpetuity? <laughs> uh, think about it. Um, that's just like, do you always have to post what you ate so everybody knows what restaurant you're at right now? Uh, but is it- How often you brush your teeth? Yeah. And uh, uh, is it necessary to post? The last is the most difficult, but the most important. Is it kind? Yeah. So is it true? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Then push send. Uh, and you won't have a regret for that. And you won't have to be backtracking. You won't have to fix it. Because once it's out there, it's permanent. Uh, you can try to fix it your best of your ability, but it's still there. So we've got to start very young. I was talking to my grandchildren when they were five and six about true, necessary, kind, uh, because they're beginning at that age, uh, especially in our schools today, to have access. Uh, I didn't and realize that that came out of the, the Muslim tradition. So that, yes, it I, did. It's longer now. I think they do five different ones with think, the colored code. Think. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think... I think we need to go back to the basics. And 
I don't know if it's because I'm getting old or I've been doing this for 25 years, half of how long you've been doing it. Um, but I don't know how we can put the genie back in the bottle. So Vint Cerf, the man who invented the internet or was, was credited with credited, the internet, yeah. Yeah, um, created a group called the People Centered Internet to look at ways to reduce the harm that has come about because of digital technology. And Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the web, has his own. And a lot of these people early on, and a lot of us who were then online. Right before, online, yeah. 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 I think we're looking back saying, we fought so hard for the freedom of the internet to grow and, and to be nurtured and for everybody to have these opportunities, but uh, are failing to put up rail posts and our failure to put up parameters so that even the things that are offline are good online is a problem. I spoke on a free speech thing at Stanford. And when I walk in, when you walk in, you know, people like us because we stand up for the underdogs and we do this. <laughs> None of us makes any money doing this. We do it because we want to protect them. So I walked in and there were the, the panel was stacked against me, three people who were very pro section 230 of the internet with full immunity for everybody else and i was saying this is crazy people are really being hurt and somebody stood up killing themselves said, because oh, they can't take it anymore all the time and um we have doctors killing themselves because patients are attacking them online and so i said free speech has parameters under in the united states our first amendment has parameters you can't go beyond those and this person stood up and saying well on the internet we should have greater rights than we have under the constitution in the united states and i just put my hands in the air and left because i don't understand this we used to blow up buildings in the 60s and burn our bras and and draft cards but I think a lot of these people who are looking at unfettered right to do anything they want to, hateful, wrongful, disinformation, malinformation, are, are frightening me. And we have to. And, and we ought to be frightened. We ought to be frightened because we, you and I both yeah. hear so many uh, heartbreaking stories of young people targeted. I was targeted on the Internet because um, uh, there was a man out to get me and spreading ugly rumors. And uh, when you have that kind of wealth, it's difficult uh, to confront it and hope that others don't believe it. But we just saw an attack on a politician to the point where he's dropping significantly. And I have to say, wait a minute, you're talking about the polls, but are we looking at somebody being targeted relentlessly with his name being called out with spurious rumors and ugly uh, untruths? Uh, and wondering, Hazlitt said, William Hazlitt said, calamity rumors have, um, calamity requires no proof, just that it be said. Yeah. Uh, and now on the internet, we spread so wide. And I go back to my old brick wall jellyfish backbone. I'm sure some of those people uh, on your panel saw you as a brick wall when you weren't at all. What yeah. they're looking at is je they're being jellyfish, that there's no boundaries. Who in the world wants to live with no boundaries? So why on earth would you want to live on the online world with no boundaries? Again, I look at that backbone where there are limits and boundaries to how far your back will move, but it allows you to flesh out lots of experiences, lots of expression of speech, uh, lots of ways to relate to other human beings, but not to harm someone. We yeah, forget I that First Amendment that you you can't yell fire and are uh, crowded on a crowded. you and cannot there are limits and boundaries so we need those same kinds of limits and boundaries applied online well uh attorney general barr has has announced an event on the 19th of february i've been invited to it to see if there's now is the time to change section 230 that gives immunity to the sites who are making a lot of money off of hate and falsehoods and selling ads on it because crazy sells um, and people will look because of the shock value and that generates advertising money so i am hopeful that maybe finally we've got some backbones in congress who are willing to look at this and say maybe the internet providers have enough benefits and enough perks without us adding to it and, and you know what? It's so important. We don't have the tools as parents or educators um, or as citizens um, to really keep our kids totally safe uh, and not targeted to the point where they cannot breathe 
or stop breathing, um, that we have to be able to say there are limits and boundaries. You can use the backbone. Tell them to get a backbone. <laughs> yeah. You know, because with that backbone, it's not a brick wall. It's not restricting people. It's allowing people. It gives them the flexibility you don't get from brick wall. And I, I think that's what we want is some flexibility online. But it also gives an environment, and this is key, that's conducive to creative, constructive, and responsible activity you don't get from jellyfish. And they have the money, they have the resources and the know-how to help keep our children safe. And that ought to be enough of an incentive. It's not, uh, but uh, but we have to push them. You just, uh, what I see going on when when people are modifying things online and, and morphing people's heads into gross situations, we have to say enough already. Enough already. Again, it requires no proof, just that it be said or shown. And once it's there, you cannot get it down. You know, um, and it affects the way people think. Yeah. And Craig Newmark from Craigslist, um, who I've known for a long time and has interceded when I was swatted and SWAT team people came around my house thinking I was being held captive and people had been killed already. That was deemed a prank online. Luckily, I wasn't home and 30 SWAT team members in New Jersey were very good at tear gassing my cat. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, as, as we it's real. It's real, Perry. Very real. And it's somebody <laughs> died from a swatting. Yes. They, snapped, they didn't know what was going on and the police shot him. Um, so this is very serious. These aren't pranks. And, um, you know, often they're often hate realize, crimes. Yeah, they, they they're really often are. Crimes. And they're always hateful. And so Craig's putting a lot of money now into supporting groups that are looking at truthfulness and making sure that content in the media and online is honest and fact checked and not crazy. Um, and I love him for doing that because um, it's curtailing the technology in the early days he fought to keep as broad as he could until he started seeing the things that were coming out of it. So I yeah. think we're all waking up after years of fighting back people who are trying to shut down the internet. Now it's time to make sure that it operates like any responsible grid. Um, yes. Power, you have to have certain rules for power, you have to have certain rules for financial, you have certain rules for health. It's time we have rules here too. And uh, Absolutely, absolutely. But again, I go back to, it's the way we raise our children backbone. You raise responsible, resourceful, resilient, compassionate human beings. They know there are limits and boundaries to what they can do. And they don't feel constrained by that because yeah. they have that freedom to be authentic. They have the freedom to be real. Uh, and so um, I'm not saying we never get hurt. We hurt one another in ways we don't intend. But when it's a purposeful uh, contempt for you, seeing you as less than me, that I can do these things to you and get pleasure from it is where we have to say enough already. And it is. We're seeing about 30% of what we call cyberbullying is what I call accidental cyberbullying. You left out a keyword like not when you're telling them they're not fat, um, or you sent it to the wrong person, or you were angry at the time, or you thought it was funny. And whoever gets it now starts World War II by the counter launch without realizing that you didn't intend it to begin with. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, Barb. We do, we do, but you know what? I'm excited with young people because I, I work with young people regularly and I, I am so impressed. I mean, we've got young people yelling at us about using straws about cleaning up our environment and saying, you know what, we want to live in this world. And they're open to limits and boundaries. They are open to having freedom with, with uh, limits where I look at, uh, go back to my theology, Martin Buber, I and thou, I'm unique and you're unique. And we have a common humanity. That's we. And so when you're unique and I'm unique and we can respect one another's uniqueness, we can then be a community. We are lacking that right now in our own country. Uh, it's us versus them. We're dehumanizing groups of people, whole groups of people. Hate crime is on the rise. I mean, look what marched through Washington last week with white masks instead of white hoods. And my father-in-law is an Italian, uh, was hunted down by the Ku Klux Klan in Colorado. It was real. Uh, as a state legislature, he was not liked as a Catholic and Italian. Italians were considered uh, people of color 
yeah, uh, I, until the seventies, you know? And so um, I know that from family history, how hurtful that can be and how powerless you feel. Imagine a young person. I've been targeted as a 72 year old who's been pretty put together and pretty, pretty successful in my life. Can you imagine a 15 year old trying to get their act together? being relentlessly targeted uh, online and offline, uh, and they can't get away from it at all. Uh, and how do they make it through? I have tremendous empathy for them, even more than I did before, because I understand how vulnerable it makes you feel. So we have a job as adults yeah. uh, to keep them safe and help them learn to be safe themselves. I was just with my uh, niece who has a beautiful little uh, five-year-old and she wanted to learn to um, uh, airdrop the picture to my phone that she had just taken at the chocolate factory, right? And I showed her how to airdrop, but she got into her phone and she said, do you know my mom's password? I said, no, and I don't want to. And she said, well, it's, and I said, hello, niece, guess what? <laughs> she needs to learn right now that if you've given her that access, that we don't tell anybody uh, mommy's password and mommy had to change it. But you, she said, I never thought she would. I mean, it's that kind of uh, uh, awesomeness that this little kid has this kind of power. Okay, with those powers, need to be some understanding of how to be savvy and civil and safe. Yeah. Keeping herself safe. Now is a time. It's not when they're 13. <laughs> and it's most parents now. don't start, if they talk to their kids at all, don't start talking to them until they're nine or 10. And these kids are all engaged and interactive at the age of two. So we need to really do something. I've always gone to the kids for information. You were smart and you read and you know the names of authors and all these great books that you'll send me from time to time. But I just learned it all from the kids. And now yeah. our grandchildren are the next generation that are going to help teach everybody else. So I need your grandkids involved in the cyber yes. safety agents program. And hopefully we can talk Lego into wanting to work with us. Otherwise we'll use our super safe um, hero and our Alex Wonder Kid cyber detective stuff. But we've got I think, I think Legos it, it really have kids at heart. Um, and so. it's uh, brave hearted people. I always try when I'm talking to groups like that to say, you know what? There are these three characters, the targeted kid, the bully, and the not so innocent bystanders. But that fourth one is something you want to be. You act like you want to be it. Let's show you a way to do it. Um, because being brave hearted, you're a witness, you're a resistor, you're a defender, and they can be all three. We need to be that for our young people. But I think corporations need to believe that too. If they say our kids are worth it, then, you know, uh, walk the talk. Well, uh, we're going to catch up more, and I know I have to let you go because I promised. However, um, I've recently been brought into the IEEE, the Standards Association, and we're going to be creating cyber safety standards. Good. Uh, so I want much needed, much that. needed. It is, and there aren't any. So a lot of the companies who want to do a good job don't know how. We need to help them do that by telling them what they need to do. So I need you on that. You know, I've you're appointed to everything I've got in the world. And I tell you about it afterwards. <laughs> I appreciate it. And I I have to plead ignorance on some of this stuff, you know, uh, and I really do count on young people uh, sharing with me at the lectures that I, I do and the workshops that I give. And I'm, and parents coming up to me and saying, I have this dilemma and watching my niece with a little five-year-old sharing her password and not knowing, you, know, you just don't do that. And it, I learned from that. And uh, uh, so I'm excited to go out into the world with young people. They've got, they've got answers that we have to be open to. Yeah, I want to host a summit uh, soon for six to 10-year-olds um, yeah. with them teaching us about all these things. So we'll put some excerpts in the room, but the kids are the real experts and it's time to do another one of those. So I'll reach out to Senator Menendez and a few other senators across the country to sponsor something and we'll do something at the Senate again. But um, I really appreciate it. I want to end with one thing that I haven't shared with you. There's a 10 year old who's going to be uh, from locally near where I am in New Jersey. And uh, she's joining us at six o'clock tonight, uh, ah. Eastern Standard Time. And I brought her to a World Economic Forum event where I was the closing keynote. And we had 
Microsoft and Verizon and all these giant corporations and, and the cyber safety people from all over the world and the United Nations and everybody was there. And she sat there, her mom came with her and she sat there and it was really funny. She's so she's um, half Korean and she's just very, she's a great kid. So she sat there and she'd put her hand up when she had a question for the leading experts in the world on emotional <laughs> intelligence written all the way. And she was very engaged. She took notes of the whole thing. And at the end, she sat down with me for the closing keynote. And I said, it's running late. You just, you handle it, Daphne, you just do it. And she looked at everybody and she said, I've been sitting here for almost eight hours, listening to all of you talking about what kids want, what kids do, and what, you know, what we should do about kids online. And she said, the last I look, I'm the only kid in the room. And she said, <laughs> And she keynoted something for me for New York State schools for uh, all of the educators in technology. So she said, I've been to a lot of events with Perry. And she said, and every once in a while, some of these cyber safety experts will come in with a child. And then it's like, hey, look, I've got a child with me. I'm really cool. And she said, we're an accessory like a necklace or a purse. She said, Perry's the only one who lets us talk. And I know you do, too. And so we need to find more kids like Daphne. Um, you'll be hearing some They're more. There. Some They're like, out there. I've got them and I've got thousands of them and generations of them. The very first group I ever had, the youngest member of my Teen Angels chapter was 30. How many years ago? <laughs> 1998. Oh my. Now she's a senior partner at a cyber law firm in New York. And mm. I sat back and it's like, you know, we should be able to relax, but not quite yet. Cause you and I are the only among the few who are willing to fight the big guys with a lot of money who are willing to fund people against us. Yes. And, and we have to, again, we're insisting on uh, that deep caring. I tell kids, you don't have to like every kid, but you must honor their humanity. Uh, you must treat them with dignity and regard. And that's what I try to impress on children, whether you're online or offline, is be a, a caring human being uh, and know that that's going to take a toll on you occasionally, but know that you, the what you feel, no one can take away from that goodness that you feel when you have helped somebody else out online because you had the skills and you had that deep caring. I say to kids, care deeply, share generously, help willingly. And that doesn't just apply offline, that's online as well. And if young people can do that, then the three most virulent agents ripping apart the fabric of our humanity hating, hoarding, and harming, lying and cheating and stealing. But the antidotes, care deeply about one another. You don't have to like that other person that you're playing a game with, but you have to care deeply about them. The antithesis of bullying is that must relieve their suffering and wish them well. Uh, and so the more we can get our young people to care very deeply, and I believe they do, they yeah. just need to be shown the way. Care deeply, share generously of the talents you have and the skills that you have, and help willingly. When you see somebody struggling online, can you be there to help them, not to taunt them? And the more we can get our young people to be that fourth character, and I'm very heartened working with young people that they can. But I also am very hurt by the, the number of times I see people um, uh, often mimicking the adult community, yeah, believing it's okay to be cruel. Uh, a death camp survivor was asked, how on earth can we break this cycle? And I'll leave you with three things. Pay attention to what's going on around you, online and offline. Get involved and never, ever look away. And that's what you're doing, Perry. You you've taken doing. that to heart and, and it's just a real joy. I love you very much. I could never do anything that I do without you. And I still just follow when you're- Well, thank you. Back. And I, I depend on you for the good stuff. I talk about you in my work. So- Oh, I love you a lot. We're together. Thank Take you care. Time. Be good. Thank you yes, for your grandkids. I need them. I love you. <laughs> love you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.